Well, it's uh, wonderful to have you all here, as it always is. For those of you who may not know, my name is Jim Doty, and uh, I'm the founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And the conversations on compassion are really probably one of my most favorite things because it allows me to uh, interact with some really quite extraordinary people. Uh, how many of you have been to our events before? Who, who never has? Who sometimes does? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's wonderful. I, I just got off the plane from Paris. I know you feel horrible for me, don't you? I can see it. I can see the sympathy welling up. Uh, tonight is particularly uh, meaningful for me personally because tonight I get to be in a conversation with a, a dear friend of mine. And um, Thupin Jinpa, how many of you know him? How many of you want to know? <laughs> uh, you know, he's really quite an extraordinary individual. And for those of you who may not know who he is, um, he has been uh, the primary English translator for His Holiness the Dalai Lama for the last quarter century. And he really has quite a fascinating background, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, but uh, part of that is uh, him getting a PhD in Cambridge. And uh, also, after um, I had started doing some preliminary investigations in this area here at Stanford, it struck me one day as I was walking across campus, and honestly, I had no interest in Buddhism, but Buddhism apparently had an interest in me, because as I was walking across campus, it suddenly popped into my head that it would be wonderful to have the Dalai Lama come and speak, because he is an icon of compassion. And uh, through Peggy Piso, where's Peggy? There she is. So Peggy Piso uh, is the former dean of the medical school's wife, and she had been instrumental in bringing the Dalai Lama to Stanford in 2005. And uh, when this popped in my head, she was one of the first person I went to, and she directed me to uh, Tenzin Tethong, who was involved in the Tibetan Studies program, who ultimately connected with me with Upton Jinpa. And it was through his uh, efforts that I was able to meet with His Holiness. And some of you have heard this story. Uh, we had this meeting with His Holiness, and I was uh, explaining about the preliminary work that I had done with, where's Brian Knudsen? Is he? And uh, his lovely wife back there, Jenny. Anyway, you know, I had gathered some scientists together. Sometime I actually had to drag them with great resistance, and, and uh, he was one, uh, and uh, to really support this effort I was trying to do to, to really understand uh, compassion better, at least on the neuroscience and psychology level. And ultimately, we had this meeting with His Holiness. And, you know, your first time in front of somebody as auspicious is actually can be quite intimidating. That being said, the other thing about an individual such as he is that in his presence, though, you feel completely embraced by love, which is really extraordinary because you don't have to carry these pretenses that so many of us carry as we function in the world. And uh, it was really just an amazing conversation. And he immediately agreed to come to Stanford and to give a talk and to participate with our scientists. And at the end of the conversation, uh, he began this animated dialogue with uh, uh, Jinpa. And I had, during this dialogue, which was in Tibetan, I was just wondering if I had somehow pissed off the Dalai Lama, because he's not really a person you want to, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen him pissed off, so I didn't want to be one of those people. But uh, at the end of this conversation, Jinpa turned to me and he said, Jim, His Holiness is so impressed with this endeavor that you've begun that he wants to make a personal contribution. And the contribution he made at that time was the largest contribution he had made to a non-Tibetan cause. So it was really quite humbling, quite extraordinary. And from that, Jinpa and I developed a relationship. And extraordinarily, he spent, he's based in Montreal. He has a family there. He continues to do his translation work. Uh, he, he runs the uh, 
Institute for Tibetan Studies there, but he committed to spending a week a month with me for the next three years here at Stanford. Isn't that extraordinary? And I have learned a great deal from him on multiple levels. But the amazing thing that came out of our interaction and his working with us was the creation uh, of the Compassion Cultivation Training Program, which uh, many individuals have been involved with in this room, have taken the course. Uh, there are a number of psychologists and others, including Leah Weiss here in front and Erica Rosenberg and others who have been instrumental in the uh, working with Jen Paw to develop this training program, which is really a secularized program to cultivate that compassion, which is innate in us, but it actually allows it to blossom and come forth and really change your life. Uh, so uh, he is here actually to discuss his book. And many of you may know that he is an editor of many of the Dalai Lama's books and also works and contributes to those books as well. So it's really wonderful that he now does his own book, which is called A Fearless Heart. And uh, it goes over the neuroscience of this area, his background, and also a great deal of it, in fact, is about uh, the cultivation of compassion. So without further ado, uh, I would like to bring up my dear friend, Thupton Jenpa, and if you can. <laughs> Maybe we can all just relax for a minute or two and take a few breaths and think about actually compassion itself and perhaps get in the mindset to have this conversation. So maybe a few in and out breaths. And while you guys are doing that, it will allow me to think of the questions that I am going to. Wonderful. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I know. It's good to be back. Yes. We, we may just keep you again for a little while. <laughs> um, I know you're sort of on a book tour, and Jim Pa and I have had a conversation before, but really, um, uh, I really wanted to talk about the book. And I know some of this may be repetition since you have been speaking to people, but um, maybe we can start at the beginning. And the beginning for you, obviously, is your childhood. And I, what I have said many times for people who've been up here is that our adult lives are often uh, ultimately directed by what happens to us as children, for the good and the bad. Uh, but maybe you can tell us a little about your own background as a child that sort of brought you along the path you're on today. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Let me first of all uh, express my appreciation to you, Jim, and CK for uh, bringing me back to Stanford. And, um, you know, as Jim said that I've been on, the, on a book tour, it turns out actually these days uh, publishers don't really support what we traditionally call book tour. Uh, it seems Amazon has changed the rules of the game, um, you know, the publisher was more interested in having a series of radio interviews, which I did in New York, and then after that I was kind of on my own. Um, but I decided to go on a tour, <clears throat> partly because I've had, you know, requests from various groups in the Northwest and in the Bay Area, um, which I've had for some time, and I thought, you know, what a wonderful opportunity, you know, I, I have to go on a, some kind of book tour anyway. I'll combine the two and uh, give these groups an opportunity to host me and also gives me and my book an opportunity to, you know, <coughs> showcase uh, this particular book. So, and, um, and this is the last event of that series of tours. So I'm very happy to round it up with Sea Care, uh, which is kind of a home for me as well. Um, 
And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it's um, a real joy um, to be to have been part of the, the founding group of CCAP. Um, talking about my childhood, um, you know, many of you may not know, um, I grew up as a, a Tibetan refugee child. Uh, my parents left Tibet uh, in 1980, <coughs> 1959, early 1960s. I was born uh, towards the end of 1958, so when my parents left, I was barely a year old. So of course, I have no memory of Tibet. Um, and uh, because my parents were part of the first generation of Tibetan refugees who had landed in India, and there were around 60,000 of them, um, after the initial kind of refugee support of uh, feeding them and you know accommodating them, then people had to support themselves, which meant they had to go out and look for jobs. And of course, my parents, um, they all came from Tibet. You know, none of them spoke Hindi or English, which meant they were totally unequipped to be in this modern world. And um, so the, the majority of the Tibetans of my parents' generation ended up working on road construction camps. And thanks to China's occupation of Tibet, um, all of a sudden, India had a huge international border that needed to be guarded when for hundreds of years, India never needed a border protection, uh, protecting the international border. So they needed to build uh, a real road that could be you know, used by military. And of course, that was a kind of a boon for the Tibetan refugee community because Tibetans are uh, you know, natural for high altitude <laughs> road building, which meant that the, the young children could not be you know, with the family because if you are working, both parents are working, what do you do with small children? And in fact, I do remember, you know, every now and then when the, my school will take me to visit my you know, parents wherever they happen to be camping, and I would see children who are toddlers, maybe two years old, one and a half years old, and they would be tied like a dog with a rope around their waist on a peg, whereas the mother is sitting slightly at a distance, but in a visible distance, because they can't keep them too close because they're breaking stones and the chips could fall into their children's eyes. I remember that. So, um, which meant I was in a boarding school and the boarding school was later, I found out, um, run by Save the Children's Fund. So, from a very early age, um, I've been at the receiving end of other people's compassion. Um, you know, Save the Children's Fund was primarily funded by contributions from ordinary British citizens. Um, and then later on, growing up, so uh, it became very evident that <clears throat> the Tibetan, entire Tibetan community in India, the majority of us, were really living on other people's charity. And charity is an expression of an other people's compassion. And then as I grew up, um, I also became more and more aware that actually compassion is very present in the Tibetan consciousness because you know, one of the most important icons in everybody's mind is the figure of the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama for the Tibetan people is an embodiment of the Buddha of compassion. And then in fact, also the mantra that we recite on a daily basis, some of you might have seen if you have visited Bhutan, Ladakh or India, Tibetan, you know, people going around with prayer wheels and chanting mantra and, you know, you know counting the beads. The mantra they chant is Om Mani Padme Hum, which is again a mantra of Buddha of compassion. So I became more and more aware that compassion was so present in you know, people's consciousness. Um, and, and of course, having been a refugee myself, um, you know, uh, I really felt the power of other people's compassion. So when I had the opportunity to write this book, I really felt privileged. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I'm the best person to do it, but at least I felt that I, this was a privilege to do something, you know, to really bring understanding and appreciation of compassion to the larger world. Thank you. The, um, well, it's interesting that you were a refugee who only spoke Tibet. I think one of the seminal events, though, which you yourself created was that you learned English. And maybe you can <clears throat> tell us how that manifested or why, because I don't think many people were trying to learn English. Yes, actually, um, if I had remained in the conventional Tibetan schools, I would have learned English, because the English was, you know, in, in most of the schools in India, um, particularly in North, 
uh, northern India, uh, the primary medium is English. But <clears throat> I left school after grade four. So I was about 10, 11. And, um, you know, my father was so against it. He was actually quite angry because I was doing quite well at school. But because I was so inspired by the presence of monks, monastic teachers in the school. You know, we uh, had two monk teachers in the kindergarten and the school that I went to, primary school. And among all the teachers, those two monks were the kindest. And they even look physically radiant, actually kind of shining. Maybe it's because of their bald hair. I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> but to a children's eyes, I mean, they look radiant and they were always well-dressed. Their robes looked kind of flowing. And, uh, and also the stories they had to tell were the most interesting ones. I mean, they were very well-educated. They could talk about Tibet. They could talk about the Buddha's life story. They could talk about the Jataka tales, which is the Buddha's previous life stories. And uh, so I, right from the beginning, as a child, I associated being a monk with being smart and being kind. And, and uh, so I just wanted to be like one of them. <laughs> so when I first had the opportunity at the age of 10, 11, uh, I became a monk, which then meant I had no facility to do learn English. But fortunately, the monastery at that time was situated in Dharamsala, and this was in 1971-72, and this was at the height of a hippie movement. <laughs> so there were quite a lot of enlightenment-seeking hippies around. <laughs> so um, I, I made friends with some of them, and, um, and in fact, uh, you know, there was particularly one guy who didn't see himself as a hippie, um, American guy, and he always spoke very disparagingly about hippies. But uh, he might have been fairly well off because he had rented a whole bungalow for himself in a beautiful location. I don't know, I don't exactly remember how we became friends, but you know, we became friends and we would meet once a week. And he was the one who first introduced me to pancakes and ham. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so I, I was able to, you know, have some practice of English. But uh, in 72, the monastery moved down to South India at one of the Tibetan settlement projects. <coughs> Again, then I had no opportunity to practice English, but I kept it up. I then um, bought a, a, a transistor, secondhand radio, listened to BBC religiously every day. And uh, in those days, there used to be uh, a beautiful program called a Voice of America broadcasting in special English, where they would use very limited vocabulary and repeat every sentence twice. I don't know if they do it now. And it was beautiful for learning English. And that's how I learned. And as my reading progressed, although I didn't have opportunity to speak, I started acquiring more the kind of written language. And in fact, in 85, when I first had the opportunity to translate for His Holiness, my English was actually quite old. It was very bookish. Um, I remember, you know, once um, during a break, um, you know, actually after the teaching was over, some Western Dharma students invited me for a lunch. And uh, <clears throat> I was quite happy because you know, the food in the monasteries were rather basic. And um, so after, but I had to leave quite early. So I stood up and I said, now I must take my leave. <laughs> I mean, Everybody cracked up. And I said, what did I say? I mean, of course, I wasn't used to speaking English. Little did I realize that those who spoke English died like that was gone ages ago. <laughs> but uh, that's how I picked up my English, yeah. One of the other stories you tell, and I think it perhaps probably is painful in some ways, your mother died when you were nine. Yeah. And then your father became a monk. Yes, uh, yeah. I, mean, um, I, I don't think my own situation is unique because, uh, uh, you know, Tibetan of my age, uh, we all went through similar experiences. And some of the experience of some of the children are even worse because I know um, few Tibetans, um, you know, of my age who uh, never knew that they, were, they had parents. Um, there one particular friend of mine, it was after 15 years he discovered that his father was alive. And because what happened was children were put to, you know, boarding schools, parents were uneducated, and then in the boarding schools, children were shifted from one place to another place. And parents, because they are not educated, 
they were not able to track down and keep the contact and then lost complete connection. So there are, you know, worse scenarios than my own situation. But in my own case, my mother died uh, when I was nine and uh, my father was ill for a long time. And then uh, he was advised by many lamas who he consulted that um, in order for him to live, he should probably take up monastic life. So he did that. But which meant I had no family. <laughs> so, and your brother and sister, they ended up uh, in the boarding orphanage. schools. Yeah. yeah, my sister was in a uh, in a baby what they call baby room. She was uh, when my mother died. She was on maybe around three to four months old, um, and so she was. And she ended up in a, you know they call it baby room, but it's part of a Tibetan children's village. Yeah. The uh, uh, but really. Things really began changing, though, with this opportunity to translate for His Holiness. And maybe I think everyone would be interested in how that happened. Exactly. Yes. Um, I mean, having said all about my you know, childhood, um, one thing that I, I want to make sure is that, um, you know, despite all of these you know, hardships, and which is not unique to me, many Tibetans have the same experience, um, I don't think I came out of it damaged. You know, if I look back in my childhood, um, I have very fond memories of my interaction with my mother, with my parents. And I think, and you know, people are resilient. Children are also resilient. And what seems to be important is to have some ability to recall those fond memories. <clears throat> so um, in, a, in an ideal world, of course, it would have been nice if I had more time to spend with my family. But on the other hand, those fond memories really sustain you. So I think, uh, um, so, and, and sometimes I know we, we worry that um, early childhood experience really destroy you for life. I mean, there's, there's a kind of a narrative, particularly in the West, where then you start blaming everything on your parents and you become bitter. And that isn't healthy either. Um, but in the case of uh, this accidental honor, I had which ended up, you know, me becoming the principal interpreter. Um, this was in 85. I was a young monk, student in one of the main academic monasteries in the south. I, I in fact, went to Dharamsala to visit my, uh, you know, sister there. She was at school. And it so happened that His Holiness was giving a series of teachings, but the official interpreter that was supposed to be translating for these teachings um, couldn't arrive on the first day, and they were looking for someone to stand in for on his behalf. And then the word spread around that there is this young monk who speaks reasonably good English. And then one thing led to another. I ended up, uh, you know, doing that. And then uh, on the third day or fourth day, the office of His Holiness called me up and said, His Holiness is, wants to see you. And uh, when I walked into his, you know, audience room and I prostrated, this is the Tibetan custom. He looked at me and said, I know you, you are a good debater, you're a good student in the South India. And then he looked at me and said, how come I did not know you spoke English? <laughs> I think he was, I think he sort of took pride in the fact that he knew pretty much everybody in the community and he was a little intrigued. And I said, well, I kept a low profile in the monastery because if people know that I have facility with English, I'll be inundated with ad administrative work so I needed to study. So he said, yeah, that's, that was clever. Um, but um, and then he asked me, would you be willing to make yourself available if I needed you to travel with me? Of course, I broke down in tears, you know. For a Tibetan who grew up in, in refugee, as, as a refugee in India, you know, having the opportunity to serve, you know, who's essentially the, the most important person in, in our consciousness, it was like a, you know, almost impossible even in a dream. And uh, so it's been a real honor. This October, it's going to be 30 years. Um, but one immediate side benefit of that was my relationship with my dad was, then after that, I could do nothing wrong <laughs> in my father's eyes. Because I had a, quite a difficult relationship with my father because my mother passed away when I was young. My father became a, a monk, and then I was a member of the same community that he was. 
then his ambition for me was really very confined to my role in that small community. We were about 30 something, you know, and I was the only one who spoke English in that community. So he saw me as really serving and dedicating my life to this community, which he had emotional connections with. This is the same native monastery where, you know, he was born. So it's, we were from Zonkar. This monastery is called Zonkar Chöte. And, uh, but I, I was getting more restless intellectually. And this is a, not an academic monastery. It was ritual monastery, a lot of chanting, a lot of prayer. And I was getting more and more restless. And I started picking up on my English again. I started studying texts that are not part of the monastery's, this monastery's curriculum. So finally, and he never quite understood me. He got, you know, and I, I just left one day. I, I just eloped. <laughs> because I couldn't explain to him what I needed. And then after, he really saw me as a source of disappointment. Uh, he was very embarrassed to his you know, relatives and the monastic community. He saw this as a betrayal. Um, he actually told me that you're gonna regret in your life what you have done. You know, you, you know you, this is ungrateful, this is selfish. You're only thinking about yourself. What about this community here, all the rest. But after I became his holiness's interpreter, that was it. <laughs> you know, as, as if nothing in the past. I mean, he did apologize. Yeah, he said, I never realized that all the weird things you were doing would be useful. <laughs> <laughs> how many parents have said that? <laughs> or how many of the people here, parents said that to them? Maybe that's a bad <laughs> question. Well, that's extraordinary. Yeah. And 30 years. <clears throat> So ultimately, though, your education did not end. And you, in some ways, you talk about your intellectual curiosity or restlessness. So maybe you can share with ultimately how that manifested to the next step of your perhaps educational process. Well, um, I mean, since I had this accidental honor of uh, serving His Holiness in 85, and uh, also he asked me to, you know, serve him, you know, whenever he needed me. Then I sort of took it seriously because, you know, at that time, until that time, my English was very organically evolved, you know. It was not formalized. <laughs> there were a lot of rough edges, actually, when I was interpreting for him at the beginning. Whenever he stayed very close to the topic of a text, you know, I was comfortable. But the moment he strayed off course and started telling jokes and stories, I was getting very nervous because my English wasn't equipped to handle those kind of, because I, had, I didn't have a conversational English. And then I also realized that um, in 87, he initiated the Mind and Life you know, conferences. And I really you know, found that I was, you know, I was, lack, I was you know, wanting. Um, in terms of my capacity and facility with English, and also a grasp of the concepts um, and articulation of Buddhist ideas in English and so on. So then I felt that it was my responsibility to try to get a formal Western education. So fortunately, I was able to get to Cambridge um, without having to show a high school degree, actually. <laughs> they, you know, they interviewed me. This is one beautiful, beautiful thing about Cambridge and Oxford. They are much more uh, adventurous, or they are more uh, unconventional roots compared to North American system, which is so formalized. Um, Cambridge system, particularly King's College, which is where I applied, um, I wrote to them and said, you know, I have, I'm going to have a Gishi degree from my monastic background but my education is very unconventional and there's simply no way in which this could be evaluated, but will you give me an opportunity to be interviewed? And I'd make the judgment there. I said, yes, come. And I was interviewed by three people and at the end of the day, they said, you have a place. I mean, you know, imagine doing this in it's an like American Stanford. university. <laughs> I don't think Stanford will be that informal. <laughs> you know, I think Stanford will ask for papers and scores and whatnot. You know, I don't think so. This is where the British yeah. system is, and uh, so that really opened a whole new world for me. And I was very fortunate to be able to do it at Cambridge because the system there is very flexible. And in fact, 
there are three terms. We call, uh, instead of semester, we call them terms. And each term is only 10, month, uh, 10 weeks long. And the actual teaching term is eight weeks. So imagine, you know, four months in the summer, a month in Christmas, and East, one month for Easter break. I mean, it's, isn't that so civilized? <laughs> so that I was able to travel extensively with His Holiness while I was a student there. I mean, which is so beautiful. And the whole teaching is modeled on one-to-one -one tutorial. You know, every week you have to write an essay and you have a one-to-one -one tutorial with a tutor based on your essay. And you have to sit, give the essay to the, you know, you have to put into pigeonhole of the teacher the day before so that he can read. The next day, he would have written comments. And it's basically Cambridge uh, in the humanities, they see their role primarily as training you how to think critically. That's basically, they're not interested in the contents and mastery of this or that. They're only interested in how well you learn to think critically. And that is a beautiful ideal behind higher education. And that system really suited me in terms of flexibility and time. So I was you know, very, very fortunate to be able to do that three-year undergraduate in philosophy. Maybe uh, <clears throat> we can shift a little bit to talk about compassion. And maybe you can uh, sort of your definition of compassion sure. and perhaps uh, compare and contrast uh, with other terms that sometimes people may confuse. Sure with that because I think it's always helpful when. Sure. Um, but compassion is uh, one important area where if you, you know, look at it um, with a kind of a deeper reflection, where there is a very striking consensus across major spiritual traditions when it comes to defining what compassion is, whether it is Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism, um, you know, there is an understanding that compassion has something to do with other people's suffering and needs. And there is also an understanding that compassion has something to do with your connection with that need and the situation. And there is also something to do with some connection with your acts of kindness. So that kind of broad understanding is really shared. And in fact, the, you know, the English word compassion comes from the Latin word to suffer with. So the empathetic core of compassion is, you know, right there in the very term uh, of, the, of, the, of the word itself. Um, I actually um, define compassion in, in my book as uh, a natural sense of concern that arises in us in the face of a suffering or a pain of someone, uh, accompanied by the wish to see the relief of that situation. And sometimes, you know, accompanied with a wanting to do something about it. So compassion is not just empathy. And I think this is a distinction that we have to keep in mind because sometimes people, you know, um, interchangeably use the two. But empathy has more to do with, uh, you know, being moved by someone else's suffering and feeling with that person uh, and feeling for that person. So it's empathy is more at the level of a response, uh, an emotional feeling response. Compassion has this extra element of wanting to do something about it. So, you know, from a neuroscientific point of view, one would expect when the compassion, when compassion is arises, the motor regions of the brain would be more active as well. Whereas if it is just empathy, we would understand the pain metrics of the brain, you know, getting more activated. So even at the level of brain, one would see distinctions and also, from our own personal experience, we can say that when we are in an empathetic state, the focus is more the problem and the suffering because we are feeling with that person. But when we are in a compassion, the focus is more on what can be done. You know, what can I do? So it's a more empowered state. So they, they sound like the same thing. And in most cases, you know, I would argue that compassion does need to arise from the root of empathy. Because without making a connection, without being moved by the situation, without being inspired by the need that is in front of you, you cannot have true compassion. So you do need the empathy to you know, allow you to connect. And also in compassion, there is a, a dimension of identifying with the person. 
This is where compassion is very different from pity. When you experience pity, you don't identify with the person in front of you. And if you in fact might look down a bit because there's a sense of superiority on your part. Whereas when you experience compassion, there isn't that looking down because you are identifying with the person's need and situation and then responding to it. So I would say empathy is the root. Uh, compassion is this added dimension of wanting to do something about it. And kindness is the expression of that compassion. When you, when, you, when you have compassion, then it manifests in acts of kindness, helping behavior, cooperative behavior. So it, in this way, we can kind of tease out. I mean, they're all interrelated, but I think, you know, especially for scientists, you know, you need to, you know, what we will call each of these constructs. And the constructs need to be, you know, in the end, when we define mental states, you know, in some sense, we're kind of defining them broadly because in the end, it's kind of a spectrum. And language imposes divisions, which in reality are more like kind of fuzzy edges. But we do need that division, you know, distinction because even to do some research, unless you are clear about what construct you're talking about, you don't have a way of measuring or testing them. So um, to use the scientific language, empathy, compassion, and altruism are different constructs. And altruism is more behavior oriented and acts and behavior. Compassion has this wishful dimension, wanted to do something, and empathy is the connection that you feel for the other person. And I would just comment that empathy doesn't, and how it differs from compassion is empathy doesn't, can be any emotional state. It can be joy. You could yes. be incredibly happy at somebody's experience and see them and take on uh, that feeling. Uh, <clears throat> And in terms of kindness, while oftentimes this is a response to seeing somebody in need, kindness does not necessarily have to have any motivator. It is actually just an act to benefit another without expecting any reward. Yes. And I think you're very much like altruism, except oftentimes when that term is used, it's including the concept that it comes at some cost to you. Of course, there is argument that there is no true altruism because, of course, it is always sometimes hard to sure. see the benefit. Since I know your wife, I'm going to bring your wife up yes, because yes. if I don't bring my wife up sometimes. <laughs> uh, but uh, Jim Pa's married to a wonderful woman, but you gave up your robes at some point, and maybe you can tell us, and it wasn't because of Sophie, I think you had your own feelings, though, about how best you could benefit the world. Sure. Um, well, I don't think it was that altruistic, I tell you. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the reason for leaving, um, it was, um, you, know, I, you know, I told my childhood story. Um, I never really had a real family life. And um, I went to, yeah, I was in a boarding school. After I left school, I became a monk. And uh, those of you who don't know, Tibetan monastics are like the Catholic monks, celibate, um, which meant that you can't have a family. And it was all perfectly fine until I was getting, you know, growing up. But um, <clears throat> so as I was getting older in the monastery, um, you know, the, the yearning for a family of my <coughs> own is, became stronger and stronger. And, um, you know, I went to Cambridge and I came back as a monk. I went there as a monk and came back as a monk. And I thought, you know, maybe I, I have come to terms with this yearning and I could see myself as, you know, growing old in my monastic robes. But then um, I realized that actually I was deceiving myself, kidding myself. Um, so once it became clear that there was a strong yearning for a family uh, of my own, uh, it, it became clear to me it was a matter of time. You know, and then um, initially, um, it was actually quite a painful process because everybody I knew, um, my childhood friends and all my colleagues and everybody were, you know, basically monks. And um, when you are part of a, a close-knit community, um, like family, um, other people invest their identity in your success and achievements and so on. 
And because I was quite a successful monk in the academic kind of context, um, I was a source of pride for my college, Kandashatse, which meant that uh, if I was going to leave uh, the monastic life, this was going to cause a lot of pain um, to a lot of people. So I realized that it was a decision I needed to take carefully and skillfully. And, uh, and also one of the things that I've realized was that uh, people generally are very forgiving and understanding once they understand your reason for doing certain things. Of course, initially that wasn't the case. I was actually quite afraid and it was fear was the main anxiety and fear was the main dominant emotion of how to do this. But once I realized actually that was pretty useless energy spent on thinking about you know, how other people might take it. Rather, you know, if I spend more energy on how can I best break the news and make that break and, and less painful, once I began that transition in my motivation, it was much easier. Um, which then, and then that's what made me decide to go back to Cambridge you know, to do a PhD. And um, also when news is heard from a distance, <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to take. Yeah. So this is human this nature. This is the altruism. Part. Yeah, this is human, <laughs> human nature. And also another thing was there was a practical reason because now I needed to make myself employable, you know? So the only employ employment I could think of was academia. <laughs> so, and, uh, and I enjoy studying and I like ideas uh, and trained in the Tibetan monastic debating tradition you know, I, I get fired by ideas, I get fired by arguments and so on. So philosophy seemed to be the best thing. So I went back to Cambridge to do a PhD, and which meant that I would be at least spending three years away from the monastery, which then gave me that space and time to gently find a way to break the news. And uh, it all worked out. I mean, of course, a lot of my colleagues were sad, um, and, and but people appreciated the way in which I did it. So maybe we can um, sort of fast forward. And I actually, I don't think we've even had this conversation, which is, so we had that, or I had that first meeting with His Holiness, which, you know, was for me quite extraordinarily moving. Uh, and the next thing is you're spending a week, a month, uh, really helping create the foundation for Sea Care. But uh, maybe you can tell us your motivation or what the stimulus or <coughs> the desire was, because obviously, you know, that was an extraordinary yes. commitment. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Jim, when you invited me, and I came over for a few days to talk with you, and um, I, I was very upfront. I told Jim that um, if you are interested in meditation research and getting monastics, you know, the meditators into the scanners and studying them, I said, I'll help you, I'll connect you with the right people, but I don't really want to be an active part of this um, because, you know, you don't need me. But on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, if you are serious about uh, providing a forum where, you know, B Buddhist insights from the Buddhist psychology and the contemplative practices that are based on these insights and that are the basis um, can have a chance to engage deeply with science and contemporary psychology and potentially open itself to neuroscientific research, then I said, I'm interested. I said, I'm an idea man, you know? I like ideas and I like, and, and also as a debate, someone who has been brought up in debate uh, in the Tibetan academic tradition, you know, which is very different from the West. In, in the West, there is this idea that the greatest ideas come from an individual person's brain like a pop up like a light, you know? You know, we, we, we have this mythology of geniuses like Einstein and Newton, and they discover these great laws of nature, and it's a very solitary pursuit. But in, in the Tibetan tradition, insights and ideas are really seen as emergent phenomenon, and which emerge in the context of a dialogical process where students individually may not know much, but through interaction and debate and dialogue, something comes up. So there is a real kind of you know, uh, you know, belief in this, this model of no emergence of knowledge. 
So I was actually quite keen on having the opportunity for, you know, key Buddhist ideas around compassion and other mental state factors to really engage with the, you know, emerging, emergingly, you know, emerging sophisticated contemporary psychology uh, and the, the emergence of the brain imaging technologies, and you know, I'm not a scientist, but the emergence of brain imaging technologies, which has revolutionized neuroscience, has also completely shaped psychology in the West. Today, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the line between, you know, whether someone is a psychologist or a neuroscientist is very blurred. And this is how you can see the, the integration and I was keen to see a possibility, an opportunity where Buddhist insights could be engaged with the contemporary psychology in that manner. And Jim was very, very open. And he was actually, he said, this is exactly what I have in mind. And so, um, and another thing was you were very committed to, you know, putting compassion and altruism squarely on the scientific map. Because in those days, this was in 2007, you know, although they were individual researchers doing some work on compassion, but as a, as a community within the scientific discipline, there wasn't much, and there was a beginning to be conversations about mindfulness, that, there was, that was the beginning of a revolution. But on compassion and these other, what I would call, you know, uh, moral sentiments, uh, there wasn't much research going on, and you were keen to put that on the map. And thanks to CK, now it is squarely, on the map of some scientific, you know, legitimate scientific inquiry. So, and um, anyway, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Yeah. Well, but of, uh, of course, you know, it was that dialogue and interaction and uh, really the criticality of those discussions that allowed us to really sort through, in some ways, sort of how the concept was going to work. And I think one of the uh, critical aspects and one of the most important, which truly is manifesting itself now, is uh, the creation of this compassion cultivation training, uh, training. training program. Yes. And uh, maybe we can talk about that in just a sec. You know, one of the difficulties for many people in the West is uh, they're hypercritical with themselves. Yes. And it's not so much, I don't think, an issue in the East at all, yes. but it's one that really uh, stops us sometimes from uh, being able to give compassion. And I think uh, maybe you can talk about even the, the course itself and, and your own thoughts about that and experiences and uh, your insights. Um, I think the development of this Compassion and Cultivation training course was very, very timely. Um, because with the growing interest in research and mindfulness and its efficacy and the growing acceptance of mindfulness within the larger society. Now, in fact, there is a whole phrase called corporate mindfulness. The other day I met uh, someone who actually has trained over 2,000 people giving this corporate mind training course in the various you know, Fortune 500 companies. So I was actually quite impressed. So there was this growing acceptance of something like mindfulness in the larger society, in the healthcare domain, in the education, in the corporate sector, in the workplace. Um, and I think this has opened up the Western society uh, in particular to uh, being receptive to ideas of mental transformation, ideas of working on your own mind, ideas of um, uh, you know, developing your attentional capacity, uh, ideas of uh, developing your awareness capacity and bringing awareness into your own everyday life. Uh, so, you know, this, this has really opened the way. And the beauty of compassion is that, you know, the compassion cultivation training is that in some sense we are building on this platform, you know, where there's a cultural openness. Then, you know, I see compassion cultivation training as a kind of a phase two of this mindfulness, larger mindfulness revolution. Uh, recently I was at Toronto where there was a major international conference on mindful society and where some of the key players in the mindful movement were present. And I was asked to give um, one of the keynote uh, talks there. 
And I actually made this point. I said, you know, you know, I see compassion training as now the phase two of mindful mindfulness revolution. And I said, in future, my aspiration is that when people talk about mindfulness in the same breath, they will also bring compassion. So I think the compassion and cultivation training really made a difference in that regard. Um, and one of the things about compassion and cultivation training uh, is that, you know, the interesting thing about mindfulness is that mindfulness is not, how can I put it, without sounding, um, without causing misunderstanding. Mindfulness is something that we have to cultivate, okay? You know, there was a big study that came out from Harvard that the, the human mind is a wandering mind. And there were, you know, around 50% of the time, even if we are supposed to be focusing on an important task, our mind is wandering. So, uh, so mindfulness is, doesn't come naturally. We have to cultivate it. And it's, you know, we're essentially talking about uh, a targeted attentional capacity. But compassion is natural. You know, we all feel compassion in the presence of someone's need and pain. You know, even with a, you know, with a total stranger, if the pain in front of us is very evident, like the person is bleeding or screaming, you know, in pain, we don't step back and ask, you know, do I know this person? You know, is he from the same tribe? Is, does he belong to the same religion? That Does he speak my language? We don't stop. The total stranger in front of us, screaming in pain, we immediately cut through all the constructs that we create to individual ourselves from someone else. We connect with that person in front of us, we feel their pain, and we want to do something about it. That is compassion. Compassion is natural. And furthermore, compassion is thoroughly relational. You know, it has something to do with the relation, either with oneself or with someone. And therefore, Culti you know, when we talk about cultivation of compassion, we're not talking about actually the compassion needs to be cultivated from somewhere outside. We have that, but what we are talking about is, you know, ex cultivating it so that it does not remain just as a response triggered by a situation. It is something that we can consciously bring into a situation. In our own relationship with our important people in our life, at workplace, with colleagues, and to, to the larger world. So, so this is where training and cultivation can make a difference. Otherwise, in normal situation, we tend to keep compassion confined, reserved to a very small group of people, you know, small circle. Uh, once in a while, through the cracks, we're able to extend it to a total stranger if the person is screaming in pain. But most of the time, we reserve to a small group of people, our loved ones. And to the rest of the world, we relate to them in terms of you and me, and I and you, we and, you know, us and them. And this is where the tribalism part of our brain, you know, becomes, takes over. And then we don't see the humanity of the other person. So, but we do have the potential. And this is where someone like His Holiness is very compelling. You know, when you see His Holiness interact with someone, he is there fully present for the person who is in front of him. You know, it doesn't really matter whether you have met him before or not. So, and you can see that it is doable. And when you are able to act primarily out of that place, the quality of your relationship and engagement with others is completely different from when you react to a situation out of negativity and reactivity. So I think compassion really has that kind of promise. And I think, so with, when we were creating the compassion cultivation training, initially, you know, although I talked about the collaborative process, initially it was a solo project that I was involved in. But once I had, have developed the framework and the key meditation practices that were part of it, I realized that it was actually not that successful. Um, Jeannie Sai is here. She tried it out and tested it um, and was delivered to Stanford undergraduates. And I needed a lot more help to make the program much more robust because I realized that if, you know, when we take, say, for example, traditional compassion meditation out of the Buddhist context and we're offering in the secular, you know, domain, 
Um, the question I ask myself is, what gets lost in the process? You know, it, something that works in the traditional Buddhist context, when you strip off the devotional part, the religious part, the, the, the cultural part that needs some kind of belief in rebirth, whatever it is. You know, one of the key practices in Tibetan Buddhism is to look at someone and think that this person has been my mother in my past life. Now, if you believe in past life, this is a powerful practice. But that presupposes that you make that big jump, you know. But in the secular context, we can't take that for granted. Then the question is, how do we bring that part of the power without that form that presupposes rebirth? And another thing is, in the Tibetan traditional context, we have chanting. We have group practices. We have the, the narrative of the Buddha of Compassion. We have the figure of the Dalai Lama who has this almost a mythic role in the community. Where do we get that kind of you know, non-cognitive effects of compassion cultivation? So once I realize what needs to be added in addition to the reflective you know, meditation practices that have been brought in, as well as the psychological education that are brought from the Buddhist and contemporary uh, traditions, I realized that I needed help. So fortunately, I was able to get the help of Erica, who was here. She is an emotion researcher and a meditation teacher. Uh, Kelly McGonagall, um, she, uh, she's giving another talk somewhere. Uh, she is a yoga teacher, a lecturer in psychology, and a meditation teacher. Margaret Cullen, who is also a mindfulness MBSR trained uh, instructor, as well as a therapist. Um, so initially, I sought the help of uh, these uh, individuals. We spent two weekends together, you know, basically looking at the protocol and me, you know, bringing to them and saying, look, I need X, Y, and Z elements in to, to be added to this. What can we bring from the contemporary Western therapeutic traditions? And I'm familiar with nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg's, um, because my wife is a trainee and she does a lot of work in school. And I've been very impressed by nonviolent communication skills and techniques and facility with the language. Um, so I brought that component myself. But the others, yeah, I needed help. So we spent two weekends to really kind of enrich it. And then we were able to you know, make it kind of more complete. And then later, then Leah came on board and Monica who was in front. So we, you know, I see this group as the constituting the CCT leadership. And, and I would like, to, you know, I hope each one of you also feel a sense of ownership <laughs> of the creation. Although I do take the credit or get the credit <laughs> because I was the first one, but it was a truly a collective effort. And, um, and one of the things that we learned from the first iteration of the course was that um, self-compassion component really needed to be much more robust. Um, because in the traditional Tibetan setting, as you hinted, um, we assume that everybody has no problem with self-compassion. You know, the whole traditional Tibetan meditation on compassion uh, is built on the assumption that you have self-compassion and then you now will be able to extend it to your loved ones, as to a stranger, to a difficult person, and then to the whole world. So that was how you know, increasingly you expand the circles. But when we first offered that course at Stanford and where we had the traditional sequence, a lot of people just got stuck right in the first step <laughs> after learning the basic meditation techniques or quieting the mind, learning to focus and become more aware, which is basic. You need that basic training anyway, whatever kind of meditations you do. And then when we moved on to compassion, because self-compassion was the first step, a lot of people got stuck. And then we realized, I mean, I realized this was a real challenge. So we needed to rethink, so we changed the sequence. So we now begin with loving kindness and compassion for a loved one, an easy target. And it could be your pet. Um, but basically the idea is to remind you and invoke in your what it feels like to feel true love or compassion. And then the next step is, if you can do this to someone, you can do this to yourself. 
And that's how we bring in self-compassion. And uh, so self-compassion, um, and, and it's an interesting question why there is so much problem about self-compassion in the West, you know. And it's actually quite paradoxical. I grew up in India, so when I first came to the West, you know, the affluence is so evident, the material affluence. Um, you know, the first time I walked into a supermarket in England, I was actually horrified, you know, to see so much food and such varieties. I've never seen in my life, you know, in India, when you go to shopping, you go to the village stalls and, and so, and people seem very confident. And so it wouldn't occur to someone like myself that there is a problem of self-compassion. But in reality, you know, the self-to-self -self relationship really seemed to be a source of challenge for a lot of people in the West. And I've been thinking about this. Why is that? And I spoke with Christian Neff, you know her. She is a pioneer in the bringing self-compassion into the scientific uh, uh, inquiry. Um, and she wrote that seminal paper uh, in 1983, I think. And um, so she said that this has nothing to do with East versus West, because she had done a comparative study of self-compassion uh, across three countries, United States, Taiwan, and Thailand. And she said that people in Thailand scored highest, and then US and Taiwan, there wasn't much difference. And Taiwan is an Asian Buddhist country. So it means it has nothing to do with Buddhism versus Christian heritage. Now, the, what is the difference between Thailand versus Taiwan and US? Is because Thailand is a much more traditional society. You know, there is, in some sense, it's more homogenous. People feel greater sense of belonging to the, to the community. Uh, and it's less competitive in the modern sense. So it seems it has something to do with the highly competitive nature of contemporary society, where we learn and where we subject even children from a very early age to be evaluated, rated, compared against someone <laughs> from a very early stage, <coughs> which I think competition in itself, I don't think can be completely avoided. You know, any human society will have competition, but there is something quite excessive about the contemporary approach to competition. And on top of that, perhaps one important problem seemed to be that we learn to define our sense of self-worth so much based on external criteria of success, performance, achievement, and so on. And we, very few of us growing up as, as a child, um, you know, do not, very few of us learn to ground our sense of self-worth intrinsically. And this probably is one of the big problems, that we somehow are not very familiar with what it feels like to be unconditionally accepted, you know, unconditionally loved, and to be made f feel complete and accepted. And we do feel this. You know, sometimes you have wonderful relationship with your grandparents. You have a grandparent who, and parent-children relationship is more complicated, but grandparent-grandchildren relationship is much more, you know, there's less complication. And sometimes grandparents are the ones who can make you feel just yourself. You don't have to pretend, who, you know, someone else. You can just be yourself. And sometimes you have teachers, you know, spiritual teachers or teacher, ordinary teachers in your school who make you feel, give you that kind of feeling. And it seems so important to be able to have some ability to tap into that kind of feeling and then build up the sense of self-worth. And without that, then you end up creating a kind of, an, a, a kind of a dynamic where you, know, you relate to your success and failure either in terms of excessive pride because of the achievement or excessive self-bashing because of the failure. And that's a very extreme way of treating ourselves, And this is where I think there is a big difference between traditional, say, Tibetan society, someone who grew up there, versus someone who grew up in a contemporary, you know, um, competitive culture. Um, I don't mean to say that everybody in Tibetan society is confident. Confidence is something else. Confidence is tied to, 
you know, some skills and ability and tasks. But sense of self-worth is very different. Sense of self-worth is, you know, and, and this probably has something to do with uh, the kind of Tibetan belief in karma, that each individual brings his or her own car complete karma, and you or everybody is a total complete person in himself or herself. So that kind of idea, and also parents probably treat children as a complete person in himself or herself, rather than an extension of the parent's ego. So maybe there are many factors. Now I'm speculating, you know, I don't have any research to back it up, but I'm, you know, I've been intrigued, you know, why there is this big difference. And, and, it, and it matters a lot, because when we have a problem at the level of self-to-self -self relation, and when we have this almost kind of a self-hatred type of, you know, attitude towards oneself at a very deep level, it colors every relationship that we have, and in a, in a negative way, in a destructive way. And whereas if we have a much more relaxed sense of self, you know, where there's a sense of freedom and sense of self-acceptance, then it creates a kind of a, a light-heartedness at a, at a fundamental base of your personality, which then facilitates a much more easy interaction and relation with your own, you know, family members and loved ones. And I think this whole challenge of self-compassion really needs to be taken seriously. And we have taken that seriously in CCT. In fact, out of the eight weeks, two weeks are actually dedicated on self-compassion. You know, uh, we're running out of time, but I, I just want to say a few things and maybe have you comment. So we have been involved with a number of studies now related to this training. We also have a compassion cultivation teacher training program. I think we've trained, what, close to 100 yes. students now. And really, who are spread out the United States and other countries. And really, I think every one of the people who have taught this course uh, have had extraordinary uh, reports from individuals uh, how it has really profoundly changed their lives. And not only within themselves, but also those around them, too. And so it's really quite a powerful training. If you're interested in the research, uh, you can find it certainly on the CCARE website. In fact, I think it, there was just an article highlighted in the Stanford newspaper about the latest paper, which really related to this issue of, of mind wandering and the power of uh, this training. But uh, in the interest of time, since we could probably talk all day long, I think I'll open it up to questions uh, for 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, so why don't we do that? Uh, any questions out there? Yeah, we have microphones on the two sides. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind going to the microphone so uh, everyone could hear. Both I'm wondering if you think that there are genetic differences in people's capacity for compassion, just like there may be differences in emotional, um, you know, changes like anger and things like sure. that. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not so sure about capacity per se, but I think uh, there might be genetic differences in the way in which people are kinder versus less kind. You know, people who show compassion more easily versus showing compassion less easily. But in terms of capacity, you know, uh, I would argue that the capacity to develop it and enhance it probably would be the same in everyone, unless there is some other uh, mitigating factors that might need to be taken into account. But in a, in a kind of a natural state, some people tend to be more compassionate than others, and they tend to respond more easily to a situation of a need. That, I think, maybe has something to do with genetic differences. Just to add on to that, I, I think there's increasing evidence if you look at the expression of psychopathy even at young ages, you can now predict. And there are also some imaging studies that show a difference between people who are more narcissistic or self-absorbed. And those people, frankly, aren't, don't have the capacity to change. And that's a subset. And then if you look at some of the receptors, like for oxytocin in different species, and even in humans, 
that ability can also be limited, the effects of, of those uh, agents or hormones. So there clearly is, but that's a difference though between most of our innate capacity and frankly, the fact that we don't maximize it. All of us have the ability probably to run and become very athletic or if we spent the time, but most of us don't. Or I shouldn't say I don't probably. <laughs> but, but my point is that uh, uh, I think all of us on almost any aspect of our human life actually can do better. And I think really that's what this is about, yeah. is to give you the tools that allow you to maximize your own innate ability. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. I have a question about, uh, you, you, you make the observation that some uh, society, they are very traditional. And we know that a lot of those traditional society as the Tibetan community are right now under a lot of pressures uh, to adapt to a, to a modern world to a very competitive modern world. So uh, what, what do you think about those changes, how those society are trying to transform themselves, trying to change themselves to adapt to the economic and social pressures of the modern society? Uh, I, I have a friend of mine from MIT, and they, they are working really hard on uh, the science for monk programs, and they are yes. trying to bring a student to monastery to teach sure, science sure. and technology. But, uh, as I see it, the, the scalability is not there. It's, it's really it's like an uphill battle. I still can get the So is your question, in modern society, how do we keep these values that allow us to be more compassionate? Is that yeah, right? well, it's more about the, tra the traditional society, how they uh, how can, they keep, yeah. Yeah. They can yes. keep their values. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, there is actually a, a, a debate in, in the you know, particularly in the monastic community, when His Holiness suggested that uh, the monastic community open up to the teaching of science, um, inevitably uh, a large number of senior monks were very concerned about its negative impact um, on the culture as well as the, the study and the commitment to classical scholarship. Um, but His Holiness has been a real advocate of adaptation and he's, you know, uh, in some sense, he's using kind of a um, biology model where species that are able to adapt survive. And uh, so he has made the argument that, um, you know, if the Tibetan, traditional Tibetan culture is going to survive, it has to survive by adapting to, to, to the modern times, not by being isolationist. If we isolate ourselves, we may, you know, keep the culture for sometime, but at some point, isolationism just doesn't work. So that's one very pragmatic realization. The second thing is that, you know, um, traditional Tibetan society, as it adapts to modernity, um, first of all, we have a very enlightened leader in someone like His Holiness. So that makes a big dif difference. And secondly, we also have the advantage of being able to look at the ways in which other traditional societies and particularly religious societies have adapted to modernity and what are the, although history does show that the human beings are not very good at learning from history, but at least the, at least the promise is there that we can look at ways in which societies, particularly the Tibetan society is still very religious. So, you know, how can a very religious society like Tibetan culture adapt to modernity in the way in which it is more constructive. So um, there is going to be, you know, challenges. Um, and for example, you know, increasingly the role of the monastic uh, communities, because in the old Tibet, monastic communities were the custodians of education. They were the seats of learning. And now in a secular society, they are independent, you know, alternative sources of learning. So in this kind of new society, how would we redefine the role of the monasteries? So these are important you know, changes and the monasteries and other key members of the community and cultural communities uh, are actively thinking about. And, um, but in some sense, you know, all traditional societies, including Tibetan, have no choice but to take modernity seriously. Uh, we just don't have a choice because the, the modern technology 
and the modern culture is so invasive, the consumerist culture is so invasive, you know, there, unless you find a tiny island somewhere and you put an embargo on, on anything coming in <laughs> into that island, there's simply no way we can completely protect ourselves and isolate. So it's sort of, there's a pragmatic consideration, but how the long-term impact is going to be, only the time can tell, yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your concern, though. Thank you. Just to make a comment on that, though, I think one of the things that we observe from traditional societies, though, is the fundamental reality that our physiology functions when we have social connection. And it is the fundamental nature of these traditional societies where there's a concern for the community, yeah. there's concern for your elders, there's an understanding of interdependence. And when that is there and you feel safe and you can trust and you can share who you really are, that's when your physiology functions at its best. Yeah. And that's the challenge with modern society is because it just slowly strips that away. And I think with the tools such as CCT, they really give you an understanding within yourself of the importance uh, of that reality. Hello, it's great to see you again here. Thank you. Um, I found myself Sunday landing in um, a place I'd never been before, which was Atlanta, Georgia. And um, it was Sunday and I had time before a conference that I went to and I was wandering around in the Central Park and it's like my heart just started to swell. And it's like something I could taste in the air. And it was like people everywhere were just saying hello to each other. People were, if I said something, it's like you bump into somebody and it's like, oh, what can I do for you? And it's like, and I don't want to come off in a wrong way, but I felt like, oh my God, it's the first place I have ever been in this country where I felt like there was racial integrity. And maybe it's Martin Luther King's, you know, it's his place, but it was also, it's a black majority culture. There is a lot of education now there, but there is also that incredible sense of humanity and people in very mixed, lots of mixed racial uh, couples, lots of mixed racial groups here and there. And other people, when I say I had this amazing catharsis of the heart in Atlanta, say in Georgia, you know, they don't get it. But someone I met from Nepal, people have come there from everywhere around. And it really became a shocking experience to me because as I had that experience more, people were just turning around all over the place, just going, we get you, you know? And it was like this inner sort of amazing experience that I had catharsis in Atlanta. <laughs> it was really, really special and that same thing. And then I got home last night and with tears in my eyes, I was thinking, what are we being deprived of? Because we have this whole, you know, social justice thing and racial justice thing, and it feels like we sort of flaunt it like a peacock, but it's kind of something that we hold at arm's bay here. And even on, Ber it felt like Berkeley on Thanksgiving, you know, that might, was the closest I've gotten to it. <laughs> uh, seriously, you can say hello to people on the street and they don't think you're mad. Um, but. When I got home, I was thinking, where have I felt that before? So I was in robes. I was 10 years in Asia and as a Buddhist nun Tibetan, in the Tibetan tradition. Where I felt that was when I landed in Tibet in Lhasa in robes, everybody in that country was my friend. I don't yeah. think for years anyone ever asked me my name. I was in Jiani, Western nun. <laughs> and it, it was like I was everybody's sister. I didn't have to do anything. It was an amazing experience, and I just want to share, you know, we keep so much in our heads, True. and that incredible sense of being part of love and part of community. We can have it, but it's like you have to take off so much stuff that we feel like we've got to carry. So I Thank just you. wanted well, to share that. Thank you for Thank sharing you so it. It's much. beautiful. Thank Thanks. you. Yes. Jim Pala, after, after being Seek Care's photographer for seven and, or eight years. And thank him for that, because he does this. 
Chris so really I, does this out of love for the work that we do, and we're so appreciative. So I was beginning to think I, I knew something about compassion. And then I took the CCT class, and it took it to a whole new level. And then this afternoon on your Twitter feed, I saw something you said, and I wonder if you'd expand on it a little bit. You said, the question isn't really whether or not we're compassionate. It's whether we act from that part, that compassionate part of ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This is actually in my book. Um, um, the point I was trying to make is that uh, sometimes, you know, we, particularly in the West, we, we, we tend to um, either devalue compassion as being sentimental and, you know, emotions and stuff, or we go to the other extreme of making it so high that it becomes available only in the you know, case of someone like Mother Teresa or His Holiness. So, and then it's not for me. It's, it's wonderful, but it's not me kind of thing. So the point I was trying to make is that actually it's not so much whether or not I'm compassionate because the compassionate instinct is there. The question is whether I will act from that part of me. And I think this is an important point because in every situation, of course, it's very difficult when you are emotionally you know, kind of um, exploding in a particular situation. But in most cases, you know, we have a choice. You know, we have a choice to respond to that situation out of negativity or judgment or blame or self-bashing. Or we have a choice to respond to that situation out of compassion, concern for the other, and the long-term implications of what I do in this particular situation. Whether it's parenting, whether it's a relationship at a workplace, or whether it is even relationship with the world. I think, you know, in almost all situations, you know, we have a choice and we forget that. Um, and we often we don't exercise the choice. And I know that, you know, one of the <clears throat> things that His Holiness has once said, and which really struck me, is he said, he has said that uh, often we feel that to act out of anger is we're exercising our freedom. But in actual fact, when you become, when you've given yourself to strong emotion, you have lost your freedom. Because a true freedom is the, capa the ability to do what you want according to your deeper aspiration. But when you are taken over by emotion, you lose that ability to, you know, act according to your deeper aspiration. So in fact, you know, these afflictive emotions uh, hamper your freedom. And that, I think, is really beautiful. So I think we forget that we do have a choice. You know, what the other person does to you, you don't really have much choice. But how you react, that is really up to you. Uh, and, and this is an important choice because when someone does something bad to you, and if you react accordingly in the same way, then there is a ping pong. Whereas if someone does something negative to you, and if you try to understand, okay, this person did this, but it may be coming from a source of pain, you know, he is suffering, or maybe are coming from a kind of a place of misunderstanding. Maybe he or she misunderstood some, something that I did. It completely diffuses your own negativity, which then of, opens up a new space. I think here, that's the point I was trying to make. It's not so much about whether we are compassionate or not. The question is really whether we are going to be acting out of that place of ourselves. This Thank is you. the longer than the 148 character. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a privilege to be around Seacare for the last three years, and I'm so grateful to everything that's happened. Perhaps the best testimonial was when my wife said, 25 years I tried to change this man, nothing happened. And three years around Seacare, something seems to have happened. I'm so grateful. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So the question I have is about the teacher training or, or this, uh, the CCT. How were you build, able to integrate something that's very fundamental in uh, Buddhist practices or in any uh, practice called Shila or the foundations or the precepts? Because that's not very really natural in Western society yeah, to sure. say restrict your behavior to certain things sure, sure. as you get into this practice. Sure. How were you able to integrate that into CCD? I'm just curious. Well, uh, the Shila is for those, um, um, it's, it's a Sanskrit word referring to morality or ethics. Um, um, in the CCT program itself, um, the ethical component is not explicit um, because 
you know, the moment we use values language, um, you know, sometimes people misunderstand. And in the minds of a lot of people, the values is associated with the religion. Um, so the point we are trying to make in the CCT and one of the basic philosophies is that compassion is natural. Compassion is part of your natural makeup. And if we can bring compassion as an underlying you know, force of your motivation in your everyday action and make it part of your intention, in most situations, you will act out in a most constructive and ethical way. So, so the focus in the compassion training, if ever there is an ethical dimension, it's more on the development of the character. And this is, in some sense, the Buddhist attitude to ethics. If you look at, in the West, there was uh, Aristotelian ethics, which is sort of virtue ethics, which is similar to the Buddhist approach. But in most cases, Western approach to ethics has been trying to find out what are those fundamental rules and it's a much more rule-based approach to studying ethics. And then if you can find those fundamental rules or laws, then you can find a way to express them in precepts and actions. And if people follow those actions, obey those rules, you'll be ethical. In the Indian context, both in Hinduism and Buddhism, as well as Jainism, the, the emphasis is not so much on rules. Emphasis is more on development of the character. You know, if you take care of your negative emotions, destructive impulses, if you cultivate your own person, if you develop your heart, if you develop compassion, then ethic, ethical action will flow out of it naturally. And I think this is actually a beautiful way of looking at ethics. Then we also completely bypass all of this debate about, you know, what is the foundation of right and wrong, you know, without God, how can we make the judgment, and all of this debate which is very interesting for academics and I'm an academic so of course I love these debates but in the end you know we can bypass all of this complicated debate and really find an anchor for ethics compassion really gives you the you know anchor for your personal ethics because the the when you are confronted by a moral dilemma the wisest question you can ask is what is the most compassionate thing to do here that's the wisest question and then once you figure out, then the specific action may need to be adapted to a given situation. But it gives you a moral compass. So we don't explicitly deal with ethics in our class, but focuses more on development of the heart, opening the heart, making connection with others, caring for someone else's needs, as well as your own. And then you know, moral action and ethical action will flow out of it. We have, Thank unfortunately, you. time for one more question. Perla. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. So you mentioned that the importance of your parents in your life, even though you didn't get to spend very much time with them. Do you have any advice to those of us who are parents here on how can we cultivate compassion in our children? I'm a mom to three children, 10, 7, and 5. Thank you. Um, well, when people ask me for advice, I get very kind of, you know, uh, hesitant. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, But on the other hand, I have uh, had the experience and privilege of raising two kids. My two girls are 16 and 18. And I've been very, very fortunate to have um, a you know, wonderful wife um, and, and a beautiful person. Um, and we, you know, she has been a Buddhist before I even met her, although she's not Tibetan. She's French Canadian. And actually, my brother in law is here, Hugo. <laughs> Hugo's sister. Um, so, you know, I don't take any credit for Sophie becoming a Buddhist. She was Buddhist before I met her. So, um, but we were both committed to bringing up our children in a compassionate way. Um, and um, so one thing that we both agreed, and particularly uh, I, you know, my aspiration has been to two things. One is when the children are very small, you know, and here John Lennon was right, all you need is love. You know, it was really just love and time. When the children are very small, and I know there's this, you know, fashionable thing to say, it's quality time, not quantity. But to be frank, it's just quantity. When the children are small, <laughs> when the children are small, it's quantity, I believe me. That I think is, and, and, and you know, it is loving so that they really acquire memories of fondness. 
that they can carry into their adult life. But as children get older, then they are beginning to acquire their own personality. Um, then at that time, it's trust. And it's hard because tr cultivating trust requires an ability to let go sometimes. And you know this is where this is where the modern parents struggle a lot. I mean, I, you know, I, I know some of my friends uh, who we have the same age children, and they can't stand their children's pain. But pain is part of a growing up experience, and I don't want to say pain is good for you, but pain is important part of life's lesson, and the parents have to somehow accept that and you know be magnanimous be present. This is where mindfulness is very helpful. Mindfulness and compassion teaches you to be with pain without jumping after the impulse of trying to fix it and, and you know, avoid it. And here I think particularly modern parents really, I mean I know parents who would go and argue with the teachers for giving a bad grade. I mean, goodness sake, I mean this is and, and this kind of, you know, uh, excessive protection. And this is where I think trust becomes very important. And as, particularly as they get older in the teenage years, I think it's very important for the parents as much as possible not to create a dynamic where there is a power issue. Uh, you know, if you get trapped in that power struggle, then you take, it almost becomes like you know, every conflict becomes a test of will. And that is a very, very unconstructive um, way of parenting. Uh, you do need to set the boundaries. And children, I find, are very good when they know what the boundaries are. You know, we, you know, at our home, um, you know, we had this policy where we don't eat in the main living room. But our main living room and the kitchen, there is no door. There is a kind of a, a uh, you know, the main living room has a floor, wooden floor, and the kitchen has tile. So there is, it's a visible division, is there, but no physical barrier. <clears throat> and because we never ate in the living room, children, my, my elder daughter never did, but my younger daughter, she was more defiant. And she would take a banana and put one leg <laughs> right on the boundary, but she never went beyond. She would eat it. And so those kind of things, if you are clear about boundaries, <laughs> and you know, down the line, parenting becomes much more effortless. Initially, I think you have to put in that, you know, and also we, we ration, you know, screen time, you know, for example, even now, you know, dinner time, nobody brings screen on the table. You know, not even me. And, you know, I can't pretend that I have something more important to do than them and then expect them not to look at their Facebook or whatever it is. And those kind of things, if you have clear boundaries which you yourself respect, then children adapt. And the most important thing really is to create fond memories. Uh, that I think is, and increasingly the research is pointing out, uh, even with attachment style issues, you know, those who have fond memories of childhood, they're able to tap into that part and develop some kind of self-soothing, self-calming mechanism. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, on that note, I think we have a little gift for you. Although, I thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.